things. How does the group sort of combat that? And the basic idea is to create social mechanisms, to create a social contract, which uh, create incentives for people to behave in ways that uh, cause the, the group as a whole, the society as a whole, uh, to be a positive and cooperative one. So um, some examples in the case, uh, you know, I mentioned the cancer immune system works that way. The police system is a way of getting property rights. So it, now if you're thinking, if you're a criminal and you're thinking about uh, mugging somebody and there's a chance that there might be a police officer who's going to then throw you in jail, now all of a sudden your personal incentives are not, are, are reduced from, from, you know, mugging doesn't look so good anymore. And so if you have the right balance there, you can create a society in which very little or no mugging happens. Uh, similarly, contracts. Uh, there's an individual incentive to violate contracts, but contracts are, are, are important and good for the whole running of society, so we create a legal system. Uh, nuclear detente, we had mutually assured destruction in that case to deal with that. Um, murder, the threat of murder, well, we develop a moral code. And if everybody is obeying the moral code and somebody who doesn't obey the moral code is now an outcast, that puts tremendous pressure to sort of further that moral code. Social stigma is a way of combating sociopathic behavior. 3% of the population that is believed to be sociopathic, in other words, they have no sense of conscience, and the only, and yet, you know, a few of them do serial murders and all that kind of stuff, but for the most part, they fit into society pretty well because we've created a social contract which uh, encourages, even if you have no inner personal conscience, you still um, feel a, a sort of rational uh, pressure to behave in a way that's social. Social rewards, like heroes, why does somebody run into a burning building to save somebody they don't even know? From a, that's one of the great mysteries from a biological point of view. From a selfish gene point of view, it seems mysterious. And a society, we have created a society in which people who do selfless acts like that are heroes and are rewarded with fame and um, people like them to get money and so on. And so we've created a social incentive for people to behave in that way. Similarly, uh, altruism. And uh, we create groups like families, churches, and countries where membership has huge values, but in order to be a member, you have to obey the kind of rules that they have. And so that's a, another mechanism by which we can get a positive sort of cooperation happen. Just to give an example of a social contract to, to sort of see how you might uh, think through it, think about the idea of driving on the right side of the road. So we have roads which are long, skinny things, and you've got cars going in both directions. Um, you could just have no rule whatsoever, everybody's driving wherever they want, and some countries are like that. Um, apparently in India, somebody showed me this sign, they have these guys standing on the sign saying, lane driving is sane driving. Because some of the people drive that's in the lane, other people like to drive on the lines. You know, there's not, that, that rule hasn't sort of frozen in the way that it has here. And so um, there are two natural solutions. You drive on the right or you drive on the left. And um, when, when nobody's like obeying the, the rule, then, then it doesn't really matter what you do because everybody's watching out for everybody else. Somebody knows quite what's going on. Once almost everybody is driving on the right, say, if you decide you want to drive on the left, you get enormous uh, negative reinforcement from that because you're very, very likely to get into an accident. And so it's an example of a social contract that's sort of self-enforcing. It's the actions of the other members that sort of force you uh, to do that. And it's also really hard. Once you're in it, it's really hard to switch out of it. And so it's happened a couple of times. Uh, Sweden in, uh, decided that you know, they were driving on the uh, left side of the road and they wanted to switch to driving the right side of the road because they were connected to the rest of Europe. And so how do you do that? You know, how do you do that? So they had this big campaign and they made these special signs and they decided that at September 3rd, 1967, at 4.50 a.m., everybody was supposed to move their car from the left side of the road to the right side of the road, but not drive. And then they sat, sat there for 10 minutes and uh, then at five o'clock, everybody started driving. Now they did it this early in, in the morning because they thought, well, everybody's asleep, nobody's gonna be on the road. But everybody wanted to see this. So the whole country was out, you know, doing this thing. And remarkably, it worked uh, pretty smoothly. But it required coordination of the entire country. And so it's very, very challenging. Once you get into a stable social contract, it's extremely hard to get out of it. And there are social contracts of varying uh, quality. You can have a society in which the norm is whenever you see somebody, you kind of punch them or whatever. And, um, <laughs> You know, that society is a very negative one. There, there, there are cities that, that have something of, of that feeling. And it's, uh, it's not a very effective system. And then there are others where people treat one another very positively and, and cooperatively. And which one you end up in depends on the history and depends on the choices you made in getting there. And so as we develop new technologies, one of the challenges is to develop social contracts which lead us into equilibria which are positive and peaceful solutions rather than uh, competitive and fighting ones. 
So there are a bunch of technologies, uh, computational technologies, that potentially can be used in um, creating social contracts, even with extremely powerful entities, AIs, which are capable of doing much more thinking than we are. Uh, formal contracts and laws, uh, creating mathematical representations that state precisely what the rules are. Um, ways of uh, one interesting possibility that you get with artificially intelligent systems that you don't get with people is that they can actually reveal their source code. You know, for a human, they can, you, you have to say something like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to obey this contract. Yeah, we're really going to work together. It's going to be great. And then three months later, you're off doing something different. Um, so humans use reputation mostly as a way of sort of committing that, yes, I'm really going to do this. I'm a good person. Yeah. You're saying deception is a human property that is not necessarily yet available to AI. Uh, well, certain AIs will feel incentives to be deceptive. In fact, they'll be much, much better at it because they can compute all the different ways. But we have this extra mechanism that we don't have for humans. For humans, you can't really reveal your brain. Uh, I can just say that I you know, have your best interest at heart. With an AI, potentially, they can actually reveal their source code. They can provide um, a provable uh, copy of their utility function that says, this truly is my goal, this is truly what I want. Um, actually making it work technologically is potentially quite challenging, but it's a possibility which isn't there for us, which if it works and if you can create a structure which enables it, uh, may make uh, g getting uh, uh, enforceable cooperation may make it easier with these kinds of systems. Um, we have to choose what rights we want. Uh, I think we're in the same situation now as the founders of this country were when they were writing the Constitution. They had to sort of envision what kind of society, got this new society coming, what kind of, uh, what do we want it to look like? What things are most important to us, what doesn't matter? And um, I think we need a broad dialogue of people of all sorts of different backgrounds. We don't want some you know, computer scientists in a basement in Palo Alto deciding the moral code for the rest of humanity, right? And so I think we need a much broader discussion about what we want the future to look like, and also technologically, how do we, how do we implement that? And so we'd like, we should create a roadmap from the present to, to uh, where we want to go. First step is figure out where it is we want to go. Um, to actually get there, I think we're going to need to use AI systems to design some of the technologies. So that's a little bit problematic because we've got to design AIs to keep, ensure that these AIs are safe. And so we have to somehow to, uh, tr trust the, the AI that we design. And one mechanism, possible mechanism for doing that is to have limited hardware and limited AI systems, which are provably can only do a certain level of goal and they don't run away on their own. And we build, I think we need to start building social trust networks. That would be very useful today. Um, a lot of business, I mean, we look at the, what's going on with the Madoffs, and the, uh, I just saw yesterday there was a, a mini Madoff, you know, all these mini Madoffs, these little guys that uh, uh, instituted fraud. Uh, I'm down in the Silicon Valley, and um, there's a guy, Albert Hu, who I met several times, and he started this hedge fund. He wanted me to invest in his hedge fund. I just, just saw a thing that basically all the investors lost all the money. He kind of skipped to Hong Kong. It's like, whoa, okay. So we have, today's system is not very good at monitoring complex transactions, collateralized debt obligations, you know, all these crazy uh, derivatives that people were creating. Um, they got beyond the, the edge of where, where lawmakers even understood, much less could monitor it. And the SEC was really, yeah, the SEC was told nine times about Madoff, and they kind of looked at it, and, oh, he's good, he's good, because he was, you know, a highly respected member of society. And so as we get much more powerful systems, we need, um, you know, a much more effective way of, of uh, having transparency and clarity about how, how things work. So I think we can start to use today's technology, things on the internet, social, uh, some of the social networking, to foster cooperative actions, and that that will provide the basic infrastructure so that as technology gets better and faster, we'll, we'll already have what we need in place to have a, a cooperative uh, society in the longer term future. So my uh, company, Think Tank, is Software Systems. We've got a couple of projects going on now. One is the Semantic Computing Initiative to uh, really capture meaning in formal systems, and the other is the Cooperative Technology Initiative, which is to start to build some of these uh, cooperative technologies. You can, here's my website, softwaresystems.com. You can see some more papers and other talks uh, on some of these aspects. And hopefully, uh, we'll be able to create a beautiful cooperative future. That's it.